Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we hope to give you a, a few uh, things to think about. And I just wanted to say, as start, starting off, that one of the uh, strange things about um, running a department of theatre and performance in a museum is that obviously theatre and performance is always changing at a frenetic pace, particularly since we also include contemporary music. Museums and galleries move maybe a bit slower, uh, but uh, they're changing as well, and that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Yes, as movements, the theme of today, we're going to speak about what we see as a current movement in museums and galleries and how that reflects changes in uh, the experience economy in the rest of the world. So Jeff's going to start by giving some context about this trajectory, and then I'll give some examples of how this has come into our work at the V&A. So, to start... I think at the moment, for those of you who are a bit unfamiliar with the museum and gallery world, um, you could see um, the, uh, the personnel maybe divided into three groups. Um, a lot of younger and particularly uh, more progressive curators, I think uh, in following uh, Bob Marley up here, um, thinking about what's the promised land, a different sort of promised land perhaps from what traditional museums have been about, thinking about museums as civic spaces, places for debate, uh, much more uh, animated and engaging with much larger audiences. And I think there's another part of the, of, of the community that wants to keep museums just as they are, that they're obviously very popular amongst certain groups in society. And, and then um, uh, to uh, perhaps to quote uh, Russell there, um, there's some people who prefer not to think about the issues at all. But we're going to force you to think about them this morning. So, uh, so I think what we really want to focus on, on, on this morning, uh, this afternoon, is the way that more types of immersive exhibition making in museums are changing the way, not only the way that people use museums and visit them, but the way that the objects in them uh, are treated in a different way. And of course, this is part of a much wider changes that are going on in the entertainment world. And I'll just put a few of them up here. And of course, some of you, uh, or maybe all of you, have been to one or, or other of these. So up at the, uh, um, at the top there, Punch Drunk, uh, the theatre company, has moved to creating immersive uh, theatre experiences where you don't go and sit in seats like this and there's people on the stage, but the audience is totally integrated into the action that's going around. And I'm sure some of you at least have been to Secret Cinema, which was established in 2007, which has changed the idea of cinema going from, again, just watching a film uh, to the audience becoming uh, part of the film, dressing up and so on and so forth. And more recently, uh, you can see that moving into all sorts of other areas, particularly kind of gaming being turned into a physical format with escape rooms um, and the crystal maze being turned into a live experience when you can actually go uh, and perform in your, your own version of, of a TV show. Of course, immersion by human beings um, in uh, particular environments is nothing new. And any of you who have been to Stonehenge will know that uh, no one really knows what happened at Stonehenge. Everybody... Uh, come to, uh, up with ideas and uh, Jaquetta Hawkes I think once said uh, every generation gets the Stonehenge it deserves but at the moment there's sort of new ideas coming out but essentially it's quite clear that at some level it must have been a sort of experience economy of the prehistoric period this extraordinary uh, structure that was created over thousands of years uh, where clearly all sorts of activities uh, went on and the immersive uh, economy has you know, followed through in, in religion particularly uh, over the centuries. I think one of the great turning points, though, was the 1933 World Expo uh, in Chicago. Uh, there's a poster up there, because on the right is the man who went there, Walt Disney, and he was so uh, impressed by this uh, great concentration of what governments wanted to say about them that he dreamt up the idea of a different sort of thing, an entertainment World Expo, where the audience, instead of just trooping around and being told things uh, by governments and so forth, uh, would actually create uh, a, a world that was as much for the visitors as for the, uh, the people. And I think this started something which we can see increasingly over the last few decades, where Im immersion into it kind of experiences once upon a time was controlled by the rich and powerful, things like coronations and that sort of thing, and then slowly what's been coming up is the idea that we, the public, have as much right to decide what goes on um, as uh, being told what to do uh, by those in authority. Other things that have, have cropped up, um, this is a picture of the uh, San Francisco Exploratorium, which opened in 1969. It's difficult to imagine, really, that this was the first science centre ever, and now there's literally hundreds and hundreds of things where you can uh, immerse yourself in scientific experiments and so forth. And that's increasingly crossing over 
uh, with the huge development in video gaming over the last 30 years, to create new types of experiences where the worlds of reality and imagination uh, cross over. Now, of course, anything that's uh, um, uh, changing society is a way of making money, and you can also see in parallel the development of these sort of immersive experiences, both in retail, these huge malls, uh, Mall of America here, but obviously many others much closer to home, and also the development of themed, re uh, themed catering. This is a hard rock cafe founded in 1971. But this idea that the experience of where you eat food is almost as important as what you're putting in your mouth. And then finally, there's the, obviously the huge development of cheap flights. Uh, it's difficult to imagine that the first package uh, holiday was just over 50 years ago. Before that time, uh, particularly in this country, you're really limited pretty much uh, to going to the coast of England. And uh, some of the older ones in the room may remember you were only allowed to take £50 out of the country when you went abroad, uh, when I was a, a teenager, um, which pretty limited what you could do, even if you did get abroad. But now you've got this huge uh, idea that of, 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 of flights, weekend breaks, and all the rest of it, which people just think of as no normal. And coming out of that, the sort of Instagram culture, where what you do becomes increasingly an important form of who you are. And this is paralleled by the development of the technology. And so while you may think of museums as just thing, things that have old objects in them and uh, 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 historical art and all the rest of it, increasingly, if you look back over the last 50 years, you can see how the changes in technology, introductions of computers or, 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 or audiovisual material have fundamentally changed what you're being offered. And I think uh, we're now coming to a really key turning point because over the next few years, it's quite clear that there's going to be a wave of uh, augmented reality, mixed reality, which alongside virtual reality uh, technology is going to mean that within the museum world, instead of being limited, in a sense, by what you've actually got in your collection, there's huge potential to mix together collections from around the world, but most importantly, to move from telling people about this material to finding actually what audiences actually want to hear. So... Over the last few years, uh, Vicky and I have been experimenting, I kind of guess, when we started doing it, um, we didn't actually think we were experimenting, in a series of exhibitions that she's going to talk about in a minute, where the key part of, the, of, of it has been that alongside all the exhibits and all the rest of it, people being are immersed. And that's obviously dependent on technology, and as with any other type of technology at the moment, there's always a question of it, is it good or bad? So as a thought before Vicky starts, I think one of the, my favourite books is George Orwell's 1984. It's also one of David Bowie's favourite books. He wanted to make a, a musical about it. And so really one of the key questions I think we'd both like you to think about is if museums are moving from re, just real things to increasingly mix them up with technology, uh, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Who's in control? Who's using uh, that power for what? And finally... Um, I think I'd just like to say is although uh, the work that we've done with David Bowie and the Revolutions Exhibition and the Pink Floyd show that Vicky did, um, people, quite a lot of people said to, to me, certainly, oh, it's very easy doing all this with kind of popular culture and recent things. Um, we, some of you may know we've recently just had an opera exhibition uh, on at the V&A with a sound experience in, showing that you can actually make immersive experiences equally with historic subjects. So I think that's the point on which I will hand over. I'll and hand over the clicker. The clicker. To me. So how far can we go with this? The V&A was founded in 1857, conceived to bring art and design to everyone. But now, as well as being a magnet for artists and designers, it's a venue for interaction and as much a place for entertainment as education. So what is the purpose of a museum today? And how do museums stay appealing in a competitive marketplace, but also maintain their integrity? We need to compete with all the other attractions London and other major cities have to offer. So we're interested in understanding how we can offer intelligent, memorable experiences, and how we can communicate stories and information in an engaging and entertaining way. Increasingly, that also means in an emotional way, a moving way. In recent years, as mentioned by Jeff, we've 
curated three uh, exhibitions. David Bowie is in 2013. You say you want a revolution in 2016. And last year, the Pink Floyd exhibition in 2017. These exhibitions take a broad approach. We don't just explore music through the sound or the lyrics or the instruments. We look at the wider social, political, and cultural context with objects spanning all our collections, fashion, film, posters, books, artworks, and, and of course, music. I'll now give you some examples from each of these exhibitions about how we brought these subjects to life in what might previously have been considered a, quite a dry environment in a museum. So in David Bowie, we had the, a final show moment, conceived to show what an incredible live performer he was. We had out loud music uh, to replicate the communal buzz and camaraderie of being at a concert. And here is some video. The thing was that in, in most of the exhibition, people were going around in their own worlds wearing headphones. But in this bit, um, they took their headphones off and they listened uh, with everybody else. And we found that in that area, people laughed, they danced, they sang, and some even cried. Uh, but we mixed this up with more traditional moments, uh, such as when we displayed the costume that David Bowie wore for the Saturday Night Live show in 1979. And we put that with a design that Bowie had sketched himself. Um, and we showed it next to the Sonia Delaunay costume designs for Tristan Zara's 1923 play, The Gas Heart, from which Bowie had taken his inspiration. And we also had a photograph in the collections of that original production. So along with Bowie's own performances, it brought the whole thing um, t together and uh, shed light on his inspirations. In You Say You Want a Revolution, we had an area where we wanted to evoke the experience of taking LSD, because LSD was such an important part of this year in 1967. We were showing the legendary UFO Club, which was a club in Tottenham Court Road, a hotbed of the underground and the counterculture in 66 to 67. So to do that, we commissioned a new light show to show the uh, psychedelic effects um, of the light shows that were shown in the, in the club. Uh, and on your headphones, you would have been listening to Jefferson Airplane's White Rabbit. Uh, and we'd recorded that binaurally through a swinging microphone, literally swung around a microphoned uh, head, to produce a sort of disorientating effect that might conjure something of the effects of LSD. But sometimes immersion can be very simple and can just be about allowing people the space to uh, have their own moment with the music and reflect on a way it makes them feel. We don't need to tell people what to feel. So in the Pink Floyd exhibition, as an example, we had a dark room dedicated to the Dark, dark Side of the Moon album. Uh, we simply had a, a spinning hologram of a prism in there uh, and the music, the album playing in its entirety. So what these examples show is that museums have certainly evolved alongside the experience economy. Nowadays, we try and turn what was once a passive experience into an active one, provoking people to experience knowledge rather than collect it. We try and encourage visitors to make connections with the ideas, not just with the objects. And the tone is much less formal and educational. It's more of an exchange where visitors' own knowledge is just as important as ours. These changes do seem to reflect a wider change in the way people are acquiring information in their daily lives. Now, with social media, it's more of an interactive process. People are active participants in the discussion and debate. And actually, exhibitions are the perfect embodiment of our hyperlinked world. They're better able to engage with multiple ideas, sound, and visuals at once than a film, or a play, or a book. Here you can see the bedroom installation from the David Bowie Is show. This was actually 35 separate pieces of media gathered from inspirations for Bowie, things that he'd watched or film of him and so on, projected onto 17 screens, which we then put into an imagined setting of his bedroom. That, that's the sort of set of his bedroom showing what he was sort of soaking up in those years. Sorry, we have to stop that now. Uh, an exhibition allows the audience to move at their own pace and focus on the areas which, um, which mean most to them. Um, 
Now, bizarrely, when we started making exhibitions about music, we worked really hard to persuade the artists that they could be brought to life in a museum, and they weren't sure. But now, the industry approaches us. Music artists now want to be in exhibitions, because museums are using techniques which are now so successful at bringing performances to life that exhibitions might actually have become a viable alternative to touring, perhaps even a better option to doing another reunion show. And, as mentioned by Jeff, we think the developments in VR and AR could have a big impact on museum displays in the future. You may have heard that a hologram of Roy Orbison is about to go on, on tour to do a series of concerts in the UK. Um, in this preview photo, you can see Roy backed by the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, who are actually on the stage uh, with, with him. Um, so, to finish... The experience economy has changed what museums do and how they do it, especially when it comes to dynamic subjects such as performance, but also in other areas um, like the Modigliani exhibition recently with the VR experience. At the same time, we need to make sure our exhibitions maintain their integrity because we don't want to risk being a commercial vehicle for a music label or an artist. We need to be more than that and offer something that visitors don't get anywhere else by providing new insights, original scholarship, a focus on process alongside never or rarely seen before objects. And it'll be very interesting to see where these developments take us in the future, not just for exhibitions and museums, but also for performers, performances, and even plays without actors. Thank you very much. Thank you.